Hi again. Uh, we are here for the last uh, free talks, I hope, because one speaker is missing uh, before uh, the lunch. So uh, we start uh, with uh, a talk from uh, Venkat Kapil from University of uh, Cambridge. And it will tell us about uh, the surprising face behavior of monolayer of confined water. Venkat? Yeah, uh, do you all see my screen, the presentation? Yeah, all right, perfect. Yeah, so uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm happy to present here. So before the talk, I would like to thank uh, the Swiss National F Science Foundation, which has basically funded my research fellowship in Cambridge. Uh, of course, the University of Cambridge and the Department of Chemistry for the support and the Swiss National Supercomputing Facility, CSCS, uh, for the computational resources. Uh, yeah. And this project has been done in collaboration with all the people that you see here across the Department of Chemistry and uh, other uh, and uh, and the rest of the world. All right. So I'm going to talk about uh, monolayer confined water and the phase behavior of this system. And before we get to that, uh, we should just discuss what is the importance of confined water. Well, we all know water is an important material on the planet. However, for example, if you look at water in biological systems or geological system between rocks in cracks, you would see that it's not, water doesn't necessarily exist as a bulk system. It is generally confined even at nanoscales and this can actually dictate geological and biological behavior. So that's why it is important to understand confined water. And then again, if we want to develop nanotechnologies based on water, for example, membranes for water filtration and so on, we would still need to understand what is the behavior of confined water, especially how is it different from bulk water? And speaking of bulk water, we already know quite a lot, if not everything, uh, quite a lot about bulk water. There are still uh, new properties coming out, but at least from the point of view of phase behavior, for example, if we increase the temperature or increase the pressure, we know how the behavior of water is going to change, which, which phase it's going to go into. However, the same is not the case for confined water, because only recently uh, experiments have been possible for a controlled system of, let's say, water within graphene sheets. And there are many... Uh, nice properties have been found. For example, a, an ominously low dielectric constant and its scaling behavior with, uh, let's say, the thick thickness of water. And then similarly, ultra low friction between the interface of water and uh, some hydrophobic interfaces. But then if you try to study water confined in uh, water with a nano confinement, where the confinement region is of the order of angstroms, you would see that there are evidences of some extreme phase behavior. For example, uh, your melting temperature can vary between from let's say zero degrees to 100 degrees centigrade uh, within different uh, carbon nanotubes of uh, increasing uh, thickness and this melting temperature is not even monotonic and similarly uh, for water between graphene sheets nano confined you see that there is evidence for a 2d square ice polymorph yeah so these are what the this is what the experiments say and if you go from the point of view of theory there is a bit of a problem because, uh, well, I mean, a lot of studies have used empirical force fields. And uh, the reason why is that the co computational cost is low. And that also allows you to perform simulations at finite temperature to proper molecular dynamic simulations. However, these uh, force fields were primarily developed on bulk water. Uh, and thereby, if you look at the results, most of the results depend quite heavily on the water models. For example, even for a single layer of water, you see that uh, Generally, these water models predict either a square phase or a rhombic phase uh, at finite temp temperatures. They don't show other phases. And then again, the order of the phase transitions is unclear because different force fields give you different orders of phase transitions or even melting behavior. We'll get into that in detail. And then again, the melting temperatures have varied from around 300 to 600 Kelvin uh, for even for just one layer of water. So that really shows you that the results are dependent on the parameters of the force field. On the other hand, first principle simulations uh, based on DFT, unfortunately, largely have been restricted to zero Kelvin within as static calculations because of the high cost. But nevertheless, uh, they have shown some results. For example, they do show that, okay, there are also pentagonal and hexagonal phases at low pressures and square and rhombic phases at, at high pressure. Sorry, this should be high, high pressures. Uh, but then again, this also depends on the DFT 
setting that you use, like the exchange correlation functional or the Van der Waals parameters. And thereby, I mean, if you use a different functional, some of them will say, okay, only square phase is possible. So because of this, there is no consensus on the phase behavior uh, of nano confined water because simulations have given uh, conflicting results. So what we propose to do is uh, like a full proper first principles analysis using machine learning potentials and using some knowledge of quantum Monte Carlo to guide which functional to use. So the ap approach is really simple. I mean, the first step, we basically use quantum Monte Carlo calculations to find what is the right DFT functional for nano confined water by just looking at, by using QMC energies as reference energies. And once we have a DFT setting, we train a machine learning potential to DFT. Thereby we have a cheap and accurate potential. And then using this potential, we perform random structure search uh, and search for all possible meta stable phases. And finally, we use uh, like uh, statistical mechanics of free energy methods to, to compute the full phase diagram in this case. And uh, these are basically the methodologies that we use in this in this work. I won't go into the details. The main features are that uh, you have a low computational cost, uh, which allows you to do rigorous statistical mechanics, uh, not cut corners. And then you also have predictive accuracy because you've trained it to a DFT potential, which has been, uh, let's say, selected to reproduce quantum Monte Carlo. And I and there's evidence that that can be assumed to be, uh, let's say, uh, the ground truth uh, in the absence of ex experimental results. So, all right, so just to be really clear, the system that I'm studying here is basically a single layer of water between two graphene sheets. And in this case, the gray color here indicates uh, graphene, and then you've got water molecules. This is in 2D. I've only shown you a perspective which shows one, uh, let's say, a line of water molecules. And then instead of using explicit graphene, we have chosen a potential energy surface which uh, models the, the uh, potential energy of a water molecule uh, from a graphene sheet. And this potential energy surface has been fitted to reproduce quantum Monte Carlo data once again. And in this work, we have fixed this width of confinement to be five angstrom. And we just look at the pressure temperature phase diagram for this five angstrom width. Uh, you all also must have known that since in a realistic system, you have graphene sheets, these sheets pull each other and that applies a pressure on your system. And, th and this is basically a lateral pressure. So to mimic this, we have imposed a lateral pressure artificial within the NPT ensemble. In this case, since we are only doing motion in the XY uh, direction, it would be NPXYT. But basically the Van der Waals lateral pressure that graphene exerts is done uh, within this ensemble. So essentially we have a single layer of water between a confinement potential that is that should uh, model graphene. And then we have an external pressure which is the spilat, which models the uh, confinement pressure. And then we have a fixed width. All right. Now I will not get into the details of how I've computed the phase diagram uh, because that will be a lot of technical stuff. I'll just show you the results. And I'll begin by showing you the low pressure part of the phase diagram. So basically, this is what we get. Actually, we have varied the temperature from 20 Kelvin to 600 Kelvin. And then the pressure has been the lateral pressure, which is the confinement pressure that graphene would exert on a uh, water has been varied from uh, let's say ambient pressure up to 4 gpa and basically what we find is that uh, a lot of phases are actually possible not just let's say the square phase we find that at low temperatures you've got a hexagonal phase and this is basically stable at low pressures and once you increase the lateral pressure a denser pentagonal phase is stable you further increase the pressure you get a square phase and this hashed area basically indicates that this square phase is degenerate with another phase which is a rhombic phase and beyond let's say one GP gpa the rhombic phase the flat rhombic phase is the most stable and just to let you know again this phase diagram is based on uh, molecular dynamic simulation where these atoms actually move as per uh, uh, let's say a boltzmann distribution uh, and yeah these are basically all the phases just to let you know the flat rhombic phase that we find is a new phase in the sense that uh, this phase has not has been discussed. Uh, let's say a, a rhombic phase has been discussed in force field, but this phase that we find is new because it has a very peculiar zigzag shape hydrogen bond network. Uh, I won't get into more details. But again, since we have a neural network potential which doesn't have the cost of first principle simulations, we are also able to perform proper coexistence simulations where we simulate a solid and a liquid simultaneously. And that allows us to determine the phase boundary between the solid and the liquid. 
and that basically tells us that well actually the melting temperature at low pressures is quite low it's around 100 kelvin uh, lower than that of bulk water and as you increase the pressure you just have to follow this gray area with me you would see that the melting temperature first decreases and then it increases back again then decreases and then increases once again so it's a non monotonic melting temperature uh, and that is just because as you change the pressure, uh, the phases change, which have different densities, you know, and that basically leads to this non-monotonic behavior. All right. So this was basically the focus here. I've, I've hidden part of the phase diagram here. The focus here was what happens when the pressure is, let's say, uh, less than one GPA. Now, in realistic conditions, uh, the pressure would be between 0.5 to 2 GPA. And let's see what happens in that situation. All right, you see that there is a new phase which is in yellow here. And before I get to this new phase, I'll ask you, let's just try to see what happens to the system when we go along these uh, two lines in the phase diagram. And in the first case, at 0.5 uh, GPA, we see that as you increase the temp temperature, uh, your potential energy as well as your diffusion coefficient changes abruptly. And this is like, uh, these are, this is symptomatic of a first order phase tran transition. While when we basically repeat the same thing at one GPA pressure, we find that yes, you basically have a uh, you have a discontinuity in your potential energy and the uh, in your potential en energy. So your solid phase goes into a new phase. However, this phase actually does not diffuse, so it's not a liquid phase. And as you increase the temperature further on, you see that it has uh, the potential energy and the diffusion coefficient actually changes quite smoothly. So it is indicative of a second order phase transition. Now, the interesting thing that we find is that this is like a two-step melting behavior similar to KTHNY theory, which is basically the theory for phase transitions in 2D materials. And we see evidence of that mainly because this intermediate phase that we see, which uh, is uh, which changes continuously to a liquid but also doesn't diffuse, is has properties of a hexatic phase. And what exactly is that? Well, this is what it looks like. So you can clearly see that there is disorder in this phase. And you see that the the oxygen atoms are basically not moving, but you would also be able to see that they are rotating, right? So there is so basically this phase has disorder, but then again this phase doesn't diffuse like a liquid. So this is a phase which is intermediate between a solid and a liquid, and it can be identified as a hexatic phase, and you can identify it uh, properly by looking at the distribution of the oxygen and seeing that okay this phase actually lacks translational order, but it, but it has long range orientational order. I won't get into the details of this. We can get back to it if there are questions. Okay, so, all right. So at intermediate pressures, what we see is that uh, beyond room temperature, you see an, a hexatic like phase. And this phase is interesting because it basically has relatively immobile oxygen atoms which are rotating. So this is like reminiscent of the high pressure phase of hydrogen which has rotating hyd hyd hydrogen molecules. Uh, so this is very interesting. Uh, and now let's try to understand what happens at pressures that exceed 2 GPA. And for that, what we did was that we found, we basically just ran the simulation. We found that as you increase pressures, uh, you actually start seeing OH dissociation. And this is one of the strong points of our work because the potential that we have used is trained on ab initio data. So it can actually fully dissociate as against empirical force field. So we really find in this case uh, that as you increase uh, the, the uh, pressure, the percentage of water molecules that dissociate, let's say in 100 picosecond in this case, that increases. And at 4 GPA within 100 picoseconds, almost 50% of all water molecules have dissociated. And when we look at the trajectory, in, and this is the trajectory uh, of the system, at 4 GPA and 600 Kelvin, where actually I've only shown one hydrogen. And if you look closely, I don't know how clear this is, but the oxygens are actually just moving around their mean positions. They are not diffusing while the hydrogen is hopping from one oxygen to the other. So this shows that the hydrogens are properly delocalized. Again, if you do the histogram of this, you would see that around a central ox oxygen, the other oxygens are relatively uh, fixed in terms of their orientations and uh, the diffusion is low. However, the hydrogen atom, which is basically this black line, this is the trajectory. It basically goes on from one oxygen to the other. And these are, uh, again, properties of a super ionic phase. Uh, where you basically have kind of a fixed lattice of oxygen and mobile hydrogens. And for that, we basically check the ionic conductivity. And we do find that basically beyond around, let's say, 350 Kelvin, 
the ionic conductivity goes beyond this cutoff of 0.1 semen per centimeter. So yes, our nano confined water that we find actually becomes super ionic at 4 GPa beyond 400 Kelvin. All right. So uh, basically, the main thing that I wanted to say is that uh, we have the full phase diagram of monolayer water for a given confinement width, and we find that even though it's a very simple system, it has a rich and diverse a phase diagram and this is the full phase diagram and the main characteristics are that it shows rich polymorphism uh, not just a uh, solid uh, like uh, energy enthalpy uh, phases which are stabilized by the enthalpy but also in tropically stabilized phases like the hexatic phase and the super ionic phase we see evidence of non monotonic melting temperatures which have been found in general in confined systems and then we also find a new hexatic like phase uh, at expected pressures in graphene confinement so we expect that if the experimentalists increase the pressure to let's say 400 kelvin they might be able to observe this uh, and then we see super ionic conduction at pressures which are around 4 gpa and temperatures around 400 kelvin say 350 kelvin and just to let you know these are relatively mild in comparison to bulk water which shows super ionic behavior at say 50 GPA or seven eight hundred Kelvin or at the core of giant planets. Yeah. So yeah, and the most important thing uh, is also that uh, the methodology that we use can be used as a template for studying uh, confined systems at first principles accuracy. Uh, thank you very much. This, this is it. Thank you, Venkat. Uh, please use Q and A for questions. Uh, okay, so before any question, I will start. Can you comment a little bit on your uh, uh, what what you used to build your neural network potential? Your oh, I'm sorry. Potential? Can you can you repeat the question? Can you comment on what did you use to build your machine learning potential in the sense yes. of how how did you what descriptor did you use for the work? Yeah. So basically, uh, I have used a strategy which is well known, which is the Bella Pi Pi Nello strategy, and we have further used a committee neural network approach based on that. The, the advantage of a com committee neural network is that it gives you an indication of un uncertainty of your neural network as 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 well. So that basically, since we had uncertainties, that allowed us to basically uh, train the neural network across the full phase diagram while only considering configurations where the network was not trained uh, so we use an active learning scheme and so basically christoph shran is going to give a talk today in the last session of uh, in, in the method section so if you are all interested in the methodology used I, he he would be speaking about that yeah uh, one question from david david kovac yeah. from cambridge yeah how have you validated your potential and dft for the oh dissociation against the dmc yeah that's a very good question actually we were also very concerned when we saw this and we were like okay we have to validate this so what i can tell you here is that we have validated first dft against dmc uh, so we know that the function that we are using is accurate uh, and for that we have tested a, a lot of functionals Uh, let me see if i have a slide on that yes yeah, so we have tested like these many functionals and we find one functional which is uh, which really gives a good description and after that we have computed let's say the error we have done the error analysis across the entire phase diagram and i think the important thing to notice here is the force rmse and this is rmse with respect to dft and we see that even at the highest temperatures the force rmse this is where everything dissociates completely uh basically the rmse is close is less than 100 mev per angstrom and 100 mev per angstrom is generally the is it's even less than the typical accuracies of force fields which are used uh, for production cal calculation so we are quite sure of these results yeah i hope that answers okay, yeah you. another question from paula thank you for the nice talk based on your results are there any existing classical force fields that you can suggest to use in confinement oh uh, I'm uh, I'm not sure if I have the knowledge to answer that because I'm not an expert in classical force fields. Uh so the point is that but if you compare classical force fields with DMC you would find that in general they are likely to stabilize rhombic and square phases. 
So there is like this in, in, inherent thing in, in force fields. And again, I would say that that depends on uh, which part of the phase diagram you want to explore. But if you're asking for the full phase diagram, I'm not sure if there is a force field, especially because we are observing uh, water dissociation. But I'm sure for particular parts of the phase diagram, you can find a force field which agrees with, let's say, DMC. Yeah. Uh, OK, so uh, to conclude, uh, you didn't use charges in your neural network. No, I, I have uh, not. Yeah. So now the better approach includes it uh, auxiliary neural network with yes. charges. Do you think that will change your results? Well, I'm not sure because I mean the errors are already quite low, right? I mean, see, the, so the errors that we are getting are like 100 MeV per angstrom, and as I have said, you know, these errors are really very small. Uh, and basically, what you're interested in the, is in the error of the forces because that's what drives your molecular dynamics. So, so for this case, I don't think. I mean, yeah, probably you can go from errors of 100 MeV to let's say 50, but I don't think it'll change the yeah, result. I'm thinking of other other properties like dipole moments and things like that. That uh, are other yeah. properties. But actually, classical force fields get totally. Yeah. So, the... so at this point, we do not have uh, dipole moments and so on. Uh, within this neural network ap approach. But yeah, I mean, but we do have separate neural network put machine learning potential like symmetry adapted Gaussian process regressions, which predict dipole moments and uh, polarization and so on. So we are planning to use that. But yeah, I mean, yeah, including all of these auxiliary charges may improve, but I have not read that thing in too much detail to be able to comment on that, yeah, to be honest. Yeah. OK, let's thank you. Thank all right, that. thank you. OK. and. Uh... Let me, okay, Lara is now our That's next, so our <clears> next <throat> speaker will be Lara, Lara Kabbalah. Can you share your screen, please? Yeah. All right, I think it's working, yeah, so. so yeah. Okay, you can go on. So today I will be presenting my talk and title use uh, experimental properties for mono and bimetallic surfaces. My talk is divided into parts. In the first one, we, I will be interested in investigation of density functional to reproduce uh, properties for the bulk surface and nanoparticle for uh, monometallic. And the second part would be in relation a bit of Venkat. It's also machine learning technique to reproduce a phase diagram for a binary uh, system, palladium ZN. So uh, for the monometallic system, we've been interested, as I said, the aim is was, was to investigate the density functional effect on predicting the reactivity of nanoparticles. And uh, we've been investigated palladium, copper, and Zn because the aim later on on the project is to like um, investigate the stability of uh, ternary alloy for some surfaces for uh, toward the um, CO2 reaction. And it has been shown it's uh, palladium copper ZN is really a good catalyst for CO2. Uh, palladium and ZN are stable on their FCC facet. For that, we will be presented mainly the uh, low index surfaces as the first step. And we have the ZN, it's an hexagonal closed pact. And it has, we will investigate two different uh, facets, triple zero one and 10 minus one zero. Regarding the computational details, we've been using FHA aims, light setting. We have been using 20 angstrom of vacuum and a K grid density of 0 0.018 with a seven layer of slab. And these two points have been determined, um, uh, like uh, looked up after uh, uh, looking for the oscillation or quantum size effect within the layer. And we found that these two parameters are the, uh, give us the optimal like uh, surface energy without any oscillation. So as there are many density functional, so the idea was which one is representing the best my uh, system. And to do so, we did a benchmark and we start with 21 uh, density functional and we did a first screaming where we looked uh, at the uh, lattice parameter and the cohesive energy. And then the uh, functions that were given uh, uh, top results, we select them and we went to another screening, which is the surface energy and the work function. 
So starting with the first training about the lattice parameter and the cohesive energy. So what I'm presenting here in the uh, y-axis, we have the mean percentage uh, absolute error, y and the uh, x, I'm grouping the uh, functional within these GGA, meta-GGA hybrid and the von der Waal effect. So we were looking for the uh, von der Waal effects with the um, takentosh Schaeffler um, uh, dispersion as well as the money body non local dispersion. And the mean percentage absolute error have been calculated through this uh, uh, equation here. And with the y is the uh, parameter studied and x is the experimental value to it. And we have two different parameters for the FCC, which is the lattice parameter A and the cohesive energy. And we have a third parameter C in the case of the SCP. So it was A for the lattice parameter A, C, and the cohesive energy. So as you can see from the graph, I'm presenting the palladium in blue, the copper in uh, orange, and ZN in gray, with the mean percentage absolute uh, average of the three elements in uh, green. Uh, one needs to like, stop because mid, um, the meta JJA has been shown like performing much more better to the other, and we have seen like the major error was uh, in the ZN uh, element, and it's due to a uh, or low estimation or overestimation of the cohesive energy, which was really affecting our uh, average of uh, mean percentage error. However, there were six functionals that behaved very well, well, let's say very well, or uh, give us mean percentage absolute ever less than six. So it was the PBE, the first one, it was the uh, MB, is that area here. So it was the TPSS the scan uh, and the rough scan. So with this element, we move to another screening, which is the surface energy. I'm presenting here one of the elements studied the palladium. And as I said, we looked at the first test, the low index surfaces. We compared our work with uh, many other computational work. And um, we compared with the experimental ones. The problem with the experimental, it was like, uh, it's mainly the surface energy of the wall particles, so not really one facet. Uh, however, there was a new uh, experimental uh, study where they have um, studied the uh, experimental ratio of the 111 facet towards the 100. And they have predicted that uh, ratio to be 0.77. So we were looking for the uh, functionals that give us something similar and the best um, two functionals for that were the PBE and the MBF. And we believe this is a small dis like, difference are due to like experimental effects such as the temperature use while we are running our job at zero K. So the first, uh, the second screaming or the second part of our second screaming was the work function. And again, I'm presenting on the why my uh, average of the main percentage uh, absolute error and the same function as the six the sixth best one in the X direction, the same color used also. And when we average everything towards the experimental, we have seen like MBF and TPS uh, and TPSS were the best. However, if I compare all these parameters studied, such as the lattice and the cohesive energy, the surface energy, energy and the ratio, as well as the work function, we have found that MBF is one of is the best of them. And we believe that will be applied for the uh, ternary of this element or uh, binary also, and as well could be applicable for other elements too. So based on the surface energy also, like we went to the high index surfaces so we can build the nano shape of our particles. And here is presented for palladium and copper and ZN. So you can see for the FCC, the stable facet are mainly the 111 and the 100 blue and uh, uh, yellow and there is the contribution of the other but um, the first part like when i said the accuracy of the dft it was like especially in that point here is uh, the surface coverage that could completely change from a function to another and to highlight that there is two points here i want to discuss is for example for the palladium for the copper i'm sorry so you can see that my surface um, my surface coverage of the 111 on on as a total, like compared to the total uh, size of my man nanoparticle, is 57%, uh, while it's 47 with the uh, MB. So the brackets uh, are uh, PBE value. So you can see, like, uh, my coverage, my surface is much more uh, 
bigger in the PBE, which means uh, the 111 is not really too active towards the CO2. So by using PBE, you would expect less reactivity for of your nanoparticle towards the uh, MBE. So the, here, really, the one need to be very accurate on picking his density function, and especially if he's looking for the reactivity of these nanoparticles. Uh, and then I will move to the uh, second part of the talk, which is the uh, biometallic system, Palladium ZN. And as I said, it's kind of related to the machine learning technique. And, and we wanted to answer the question, how to use the computational data to accelerate discovery of new material. And I have classified or uh, like determined three different pillars for the machine learning process. The first one, when we are calculating or like data creation. So you create your data. Uh, from a XRD library, or you generate them randomly. And then you start doing your simulation and you collect your data and you classify them through a database of the specific property you're studying. And the last part of your uh, machine learning technique will be the material discovery. So you suggest a new material where you can easily predict within the database studied or your property studied, you can easily detect uh, the predict on it. And um, why we are doing that, it, it was supposed to be a, a movie here, but unfortunately I, don't, I had to go to PDF uh, format. So the idea, because it's like the combinatory explosion of possible materials is really too bit, very large. And there are many decorations to be explored via uh, high through computing. So for example, if you have this uh, small size three by three by three model and you want to put your substitution, there are too many decorations where this uh, substitution could uh, be there. And by then, like, if you want to compute everything, it's very like, time consuming. So what we are using, as I said, we are using a cluster expansion technique and uh, that has been applied with cell software. And the advantage of that technique is to allow us to run some Monte Carlo, which uh, give us the entropy for the allow, which is really important. And the sec and second part of any machine learning, you train your, you train your system on a small model and then you can predict on much more bigger one. In our studies, the model has been fitted with the mixing energy per atom. And the machine learning algorithms are uh, uh, like uh, integrated in cell, but what I was using was uh, the linear regression from the Skitlearn library. And as I said, the aim is to reproduce the phase diagram of Palladium ZN. So the phase diagram of Palladium ZN experimentally is very challenging. You can see within the concentration on the X direction and the temperature, you have different phases and intermediates that are stable. So you start with a palladium in the FCC structure, and then when you increase your substitution, so you, you start with a autorambic Z and palladium two, then you have a ZDN and palladium one to one, and there are the two main uh, structure here, the beta, which is a body-centered diagonal, and the alpha is the uh, face cubic center, and you continue with the, uh, you increase, when you increase the concentration, many other occur, and you end up at the end with a ZN and uh, HCP. However, to make the problem less complicated, we decided to go with only three, uh, three different phase. And every time we had to train the model with uh, like the three different uh, facets, we cannot combine in, man in our model different crystallographic uh, structures. So the FCC should go with a CA cluster expansion model in the FCC, starting with FCC lattice parameter, the same with BCT, uh, body centered diagonal, and the SCP. And we, as we said, like the model has been fitted with the mixing energy per atom but through uh, completely relaxed geometry. So what we did is we relaxed the lattice parameter as well as the position. And we start with a hundred of random structure for a two by two by two system where we believe that is accurate enough to take into account the majority of the configuration. So what happened during our optimization, what I'm showing in the, um, on the graph on the red, uh, within the concentration and the uh, C2A ratio, we have seen that all the body-centered diagonal were relaxing back to an FCC. And the problem and the body centered diagonal is only available, which is experimentally uh, accurate, is only available for the composition 0 0.1. However, we cannot really run a model on the on one structure. So we decided to go with the FCC uh, representation for the uh, uh, palladium that n one to one. For that, like we reduce, and this was like what uh, Galler and all have demonstrated on the paper, like there are always coexistence of uh, palladium 
beta and gamma at the 0.5 concentration and existence of the other facet at the FCC facet for C other. So with that, we have built our uh, FCC model and the optimal parameter where was five body cluster pool and we had a mean absolute error of 0 0.01. And to make sure that our model is correct, what we did is a, uh, we ran Monte Carlo search for the local minimal, we collect the structure and we compare the predict towards the DFT. And you can see, for example, like it's matching very well, the green and the black point are matching very well within the concentration. And we have the lowest uh, concentration, uh, lowest energy is always for the palladium one to one, 50% concentration of that. And uh, for the, um, for the um, you can see it's a bit of the cha change here at the 0 0.3 is where the structure is trying to uh, organize itself on the autorhombic uh, position. Anyway, for the three by three by three, when we compare, we have found uh, some lower points, we believe because they are ordered that uh, give us lowest energy and that wasn't present with a small size two by two by two. Regarding the SCP model, the same we have built, the optimal one was, optim was uh, obtained with a five body cluster and the mean absolute error was 0 0.04 and the same technique we collect the lowest energy from Monte Carlo search we compare with the FT we did also for the three by three by three and we compare it with also a four by four but what uh, was interesting is on the um, uh, uh, odd number like three by three by three we cannot really get the lowest energy this is the uh, due to the uh, ordering of the uh, of the element so uh, for the two by two by two, it was like one palladium next to it, one that n. While for the three by three, we cannot really have that kind of uh, uh, of ordering as it's need an even number. So that's why we had these uh, a bit of changes in the energy between and the three by three by three system and any even number of uh, size uh, of the palladium set n, and that has been confirmed by the FT. So to finalize and like we put together the computed phase diagram, as I said, we removed the beta uh, tetragonal body centered and we kept with the FCC and the SCP. And you can see like we went with the two by two by two to three by three, but also is a four by four by four model. And in both cases, like what we have seen is the FCC is dominant everywhere, except at the really high concentration where the ZN is supposed to exist only in that area above uh, after the 80% exactly on the like the experimental phase diagram. And of course we have uh, palladium ZN at concentration one to one is the lowest energy, uh, mixing energy for all the other concentration. And as a conclusion and next step, as I said, for the monometer, like uh, we highlight a bit the importance of the density function on predicting the reactivity of nanoparticle. And we have shown that MBF is uh, one of the best for the copper palladium ZN and could expand it for other elements or binary and ternary alloy. Regarding the uh, cluster expansion for the palladium ZN, as I said, the body center has been relaxed to an FCC, and we only see the uh, SCP for above concentration 85% in, uh, in agreement with the experimental part. As the next step, we believe that we need to uh, build the convex hole for a much more bigger system, and maybe introduce other facets like the autorhombic phase palladium, uh, that end, palladium to that end. And with that, I would I'd like to finish and um, thanks everyone, especially the people who really uh, interact a lot with this work. My line manager, Professor Sir Richard Catlow and Dr. Andy Loxdale. I also thanks my colleague Igor Kowalak for all his help on the machine learning with his Python skill. Our collaborators, cell developers, Santiago and Maria, as well as the Matthias Schaffler group from Berlin. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Lara. Okay, please use the mic for questions for Lara. And, uh, if there are no uh, questions, uh, I will start. So, since you come from a catalysis group, you can tell us of uh, one of the, let's say, spectacular applications of this. Uh, complexes that you are looking at. The palladium that N? Uh, yeah, for example. Uh, so one, uh, the interest of that is really um, the, main, the main idea of the group uh, project is to look for the stable facet of palladium that N and even for 10 nanic palladium that N coupled towards CO2 reaction 
to methanol or all the other uh, elements. Okay, so I see no, no other question. So then we should move then. We should thank Lara and we should move to our next speaker. Thank you, Lara. Okay. Our next speaker is Aziz Goufi uh, from France. Aziz, I went. Can you try to share your screen, please? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Okay, it's okay. Okay, yes, we see. Uh, I try to. You can, uh, you, you can start uh, whenever you are ready. Okay? Okay. Our next speaker, Aziz Kufi from REN. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is um, uh, Aziz Goufi, and I work uh, in the Physical Institute of uh, REN at Brittany in France. Um, today, I present uh, a work uh, uh, about the influence of uh, water models on the prediction of desalination performance uh, through the nanoporous membrane as, uh, as uh, boron uh, nitride and uh, graphene. Uh, as shown in this map, uh, several countries undergo water stress due to the intensive use of fresh water that represents uh, approximately three um, percent. Yes, your slides didn't move. Oh, you have to click on the okay. arrow or something. Okay. It's okay now. No. Oh. Oh, sorry. Oh, it's very strange. I try to. Uh... Okay. We see, we see the top slide, but uh... oh, okay, oh, okay, 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 okay. Now it's okay, okay now. It's, now it works. Yeah. Oh, okay. Now it works. Good. Uh, uh, in this, uh, oh, I, uh, I, uh, I repeat again. I in this slide, um, I shown. Um, that uh, several countries undergo water stress. Uh, down uh, uh, to the intensive use of uh, fresh water. And um, uh, United Nations uh, suggests that in five years, uh, there are uh, uh, water scarcity. Um, and to resolve this problem, uh, it's possible to, um, to make uh, desalination of seawater. And this methodology seems um, to be a relevant solution to uh, produce uh, fresh water. And uh, okay, um, there are uh, several uh, methodology to uh, to desalinize, and uh, among these methods, uh, membrane processes seems to be the most suitable because this method is uh, very green processes. No, uh, in comparison with distillation, capacitive deionization. Uh, membrane processes is uh, compact and uh, energy efficient methodology. And then uh, this uh, approach is um, often used in uh, plant desalination. Uh, among the, uh, the most used uh, methodology um, to, uh, in the membrane uh, process is the reverse uh, osmosis. Uh, in this method, we apply a pressure, a difference pressure on uh, the seawater, the salt solution uh, through a, a polyamide a polymer membrane, uh, such that uh, the, the ion are stopped and uh, the water is uh, is uh, is translocated through the membrane to produce uh, fresh water. Among uh, the the polymeric membrane, 
polyamide uh, membrane is probably the most used. In, 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 that is down to do to the uh, low cost uh, to produce this uh, polyamide. But uh, the, uh, the the major problem of uh, this poly polymer is the is the density because uh, the high density of this polymer uh, reduces the flow of uh, water through the membrane and then uh, we use the high pressure pump uh, to uh, transloc translocate the water molecules through um, the membrane and then we increase uh, the energy cost to uh, to resolve this problem, to resolve this problem, uh, we use uh, we take the route uh, uh, to um, improve the reverse osmosis process um, uh, by using the pressure loss. This uh, this point is uh, an is an engineering point point of view. Uh, the second solution is to improve. Uh, the performance, the desalination performance by um, uh, modifying uh, polyamide uh, from uh, chemistry, um, and uh, the the last solution is, and probably uh, the most used is, is to develop new uh, membrane, and uh, among uh, new membrane, it, it it has been shown that the hydrophobic uh, nanoporous uh, two-dimensional membrane as uh, graphene and boron uh, natride is uh, probably um, uh, the most used and a very interesting uh, uh, material because uh, the low friction uh, between the hydrophobic surface and the water molecules uh, allow uh, to increase the slippage and the, the uh, water sliding along the what um, solid wall. Uh, among uh, two dimensional materials, uh, two uh, membrane has been investigated. Um, the nanoporous hexagonal graphene uh, and uh, the hexagonal boron natride. Uh, the second membrane is probably um, uh, the membrane with the high mechanical resistance and the high hydrophobicity in comparison with uh, uh, nanoporous graphene. And uh, f it is uh, this reason that we uh, uh, stewed the, this membrane. Uh, indeed, we have uh, recently shown <coughs> that the uh, uh, boron nitride is a very relevant membrane to uh, use in desalination plant because uh, we improve the rejection rate in comparison with the uh, polyamide and we uh, improve the water permeability as shown in this uh, uh, figure. Uh, boron uh, nitride is very uh, uh, interesting in comparison also with uh, the nanoporous graphene. Um, the problem with this uh, two-dimensional membrane is this, uh, the fabrication uh, at the industrial scale because um, the experimental setup is not mature, and then uh, several uh, theoretical and numerical studies have been uh, have been devoted to the prediction and the understanding at the molecular scale uh, of the desalination properties through uh, this nanoporous membrane. And then uh, several groups have been undertaken a, a molecular study from by from molecular dynamics simulation and then by using several uh, water models. Uh, recently, uh, Prasad et all have, uh, have shown uh, that uh, according to uh, the water model, it's possible to, uh, to have a different water flux, water flow, uh, as shown in this table, uh, that suggests uh, uh, um, 
big uh, careful uh, to uh, uh, the choice of the water model. Uh, objectives of uh, this work uh, is the prediction of the transport property through uh, the boron nitride and uh, as a function of the water models and uh, to uh, the understanding at the molecular scale of the water transport uh, through the nanopore. Uh, methodology uh, to uh, perform, to uh, study uh, the influence of water model, we use uh, uh, pressure uh, driven molecular dynamic simulation and equilibrium molecular dynamic simulation. Uh, we make uh, a nanopore into the uh, boron nitride and we use a graphitic wall. Uh, on, uh, on, uh, and we apply a, differ a pressure, a difference of pressure on two uh, graphitic piston, and then we model the transport of water and uh, ions through uh, the nanopore. Uh, we investigate uh, five uh, water uh, model. We use uh, non polarizable uh, and rigid model because it is the most used in the uh, literature. Uh, we, um, we opt for, uh, for uh, on uh, five water model, uh, SPC, SPC Evald, TIP4P Evald, etc. Uh, in this table, we provide uh, different structural uh, characteristics. Uh, distance, angle, charge, and the transparent parameter. We, uh, we observe uh, uh, a few differences in uh, energetic parameter in terms of uh, partial charge and the transparent parameter. And uh, okay, when we, uh, when we uh, calculate the water flux and uh, the rejection rate, um, of, uh, of uh, water uh, through the, the membrane, we show uh, a, a very strong uh, difference between models uh, because the, uh, the SPC uh, uh, model show a high water flux and a high rejection rate, while the TIP4P uh, 2005 model, water model, uh, provide um, a low water flux. Uh, in this work, we try to understand this uh, difference between, uh, uh, between uh, water model and we investigate <coughs> and we investigate uh, interfacial uh, properties. In, uh, in general, uh, the friction coefficient is often uh, investigated to explain the difference between uh, what between uh, uh, water flow uh, between graphene and uh, boron nitride, between polyamide and nanoporous graphene, and. Uh, and this work, uh, we prefer uh, to investigate uh, uh, the surface tension uh, because we have shown recently uh, that the surface tension, it, uh, it, it is uh, uh, relevant properties to um, uh, explain the difference in water permeability uh, through nanoporous membrane. In this figure, in the right uh, uh, figure, we, we have uh, reported the local surface tension as a function of the of two uh, materials, graphene and uh, um, boron nitride, and we show um, a surface tray, surface tension gradient. Uh, this uh, this gradient uh, is a, a local Marangoni effect. And uh, this effect can uh, can explain the difference of uh, in water permeability between uh, both uh, membrane. 
the the question is uh, what is the role of the surface tension and the possible role of surface tension <clears throat> for that we have uh, computed uh, the water flux uh, between different water models and the surface tension as a function of water model and we show uh, an, uh, a correlation between uh, uh, water flux and surface tension. Uh, this, co this correlation is counterintuitive because, um, uh, in general, when the surface tension increases, uh, the sliding increases and the water flux increases. Uh, in, in this, uh, uh, in this uh, figure, we show that the water flux increase as the surface tension uh, decrease. Uh, we have calculated also the contact angle uh, and we compare with the experiment and we show that the uh, TIP, uh, TIP uh, for, uh, 2005 model uh, presents uh, um, a quantitative result between, with uh, the experiment. And then this model is probably the most uh, uh, relevant to model the, the flow, uh, the water flow through uh, the, what, the nanoporous membrane. Uh, to explain uh, this difference in surface tension, we calculate um, uh, the local surface tension and we show uh, that uh, the uh, difference in surface macroscopic surface tension is down to the uh, local contribution close to the uh, solid surface. And uh, to explain this, uh, to explain this difference, we have uh, also calculated the interfacial energy, uh, and we show uh, a strong correlation between the water flux and the interfacial energy. Uh, this correlation between uh, these uh, two properties indicate that uh, uh, when uh, the uh, surface tension is very small, the, interf the interfacial energy is also uh, small and the, the anchoring of water molecule on the surface is very small and then uh, this uh, involves an increase of water flux. <clears throat> in this work, uh, we have shown uh, differences uh, between uh, in water permeability uh, between uh, water models. We have shown uh, that uh, the surface tension is well correlated with the water uh, permeability. We have also shown uh, that the uh, TIP uh, 2005 model is probably the most uh, relevant model to um, uh, evaluate uh, the uh, water uh, property, transport properties. We have shown uh, a very weak surface tension is correlated to the weak total interfacial energy that uh, involve <coughs> uh, a decrease of the incurring of water molecule on the surface. Uh, that explain the increase in water permeability. Uh, okay, thank you for uh, your attention. Okay, let's thank you to Aziz. <laughs> and, uh, questions and uh, comments, if you have any, please. Okay, so before people get the courage, uh, I will uh, try. Okay, so you studied pure water in your... Uh, yeah. What about when you start to add... Uh, because the water, the ions and other bits that usually the water contains in reality. Uh, okay. The water? I mean, real water doesn't... is not pure water. It has all kinds of... In this, you know, yeah. We have uh, we have uh, studied the pure water uh, transfer for the membrane and the uh, salted water, and we show in uh, both uh, situation uh, similar conclusion on the uh, surface tension. 
we have calculated surface tension of pure water and um, uh, seawater uh, and seawater, and we observe uh, uh, the, the similar evolution of uh, the similar correlation between surface tension and uh, and the water flux. In this, uh, we also show that the, uh, a, a small impact of uh, ions on the uh, on the surface tension and water permeability. Okay, thank you. Uh, Otello Roshoni has a question for you. Otello? Yes, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, yeah, nice talk. Um, I was wondering, so you showed a, a lot of, um, I mean, the effect of different water models uh, on the properties uh, for uh, the, uh, the transport mechanism. Um, I was wondering uh, if you um, consider different force fields to represent the membrane and what's the effect on, uh, on the uh, permeability uh, upon using different uh, uh, force fields for yeah, the membranes? Uh, okay. Uh... <laughs> This question is very interesting, and we have um, and we have uh, test, uh, tested uh, several force fields to model the uh, to model the Bowen natride. We use a flexible for fi force field. We use a rigid force field. We use a reactive uh, force field, and uh, whatever the situation, uh, the correlation between water flux. And uh, the surface tension um, uh, was found. Uh, we found also a slight difference between um, uh, water flux, but uh, this difference is due, uh, as mentioned, is due to the force field to the power meter. But the, the tendency, the trend between uh, uh, of the surface tension as a function of the water permeability is well recovered, uh, whatever the force field of the uh, boron uh, nitride. We um, also tested um, the graphene and the nanoporous graphene, and we also uh, observed this correlation between the interfacial energy in surface tension and the water permeability. Well, thank you. That's interesting. Thanks. OK, so since I see no question in the interest of time, we should thank uh, Aziz and we should thank all our speakers, uh, Lara and Venkat, in this session. And we should uh, break for lunch. Thank you all for attending. <laughs>